So this brings us to relaxation, uh, the first part. And um, we've actually been assiduously ignoring relaxation so far. Uh, right at the beginning, when we talked about the vector model, uh, I said that you know the xy magnetization would process. Um, and in fact, as far as I was concerned at that point, it's still processing now. Right? Um, we didn't include relaxation. But as you know, uh, relaxation does occur in NMR, and it's the thing that drives your system uh, uh, away. It's the thing that makes the free induction decay, decay and so on. And uh, the description of relaxation is quite complicated theoretically. So we're going to concentrate on the, the, the underlying concepts rather than the details of the theory. So what is relaxation? Well, it's the process which drives the spins to equilibrium. Now, what is equilibrium? Well, you know what equilibrium is. At equilibrium, you've got magnetization along the z-axis, and there is no x and y magnetization. So going to equilibrium means generating the equilibrium z-magnetization and the x and y magnetization going away. And when you're at equilibrium, nothing happens. It actually could be one of the definitions. When you've got a system that has no time dependence, it's at equilibrium. And if you think about that, the Z magnetization doesn't process. So it's not changing with time. X and Y magnetization does process, but at equilibrium, there's no X or Y magnetization. So at equilibrium, you're also in a situation where uh, there's nothing happening. Now, this is a natural process. It occurs in the sample without you doing anything at all. And it's driven, in the case of NMR, by molecular motion. Uh, and that's one of the things we're actually going to spend quite a lot of time describing, how molecular motion drives uh, uh, NMR relaxation. Relaxation in NMR is unusually slow compared to other kinds of spectroscopy. And in fact, it's one of the nice things about NMR is that, that the relaxation is slow enough that it's relatively easy to measure it. If you were interested in uh, electronic excited states or something, uh, you're, you really wouldn't find it possible to measure relaxation because it's so quick. Now, because, uh, molecular, because relaxation is driven by molecular motion, you can use relaxation measurements as a probe for molecular motion. And this has been done for many years uh, in NMR and has become particularly popular uh, in people who are interested in the dynamics of proteins. So if you can, through NMR measurements, say something about uh, the kinds of motions that proteins and macromolecules are uh, undergoing. And the final thing is that the very important nuclear overhauser effect, which is absolutely crucial for day-to-day -day spectroscopy uh, in uh, routine kind of chemistry, uh, this is a relaxation-derived effect, uh, and it can be used to give an estimate of distance. Uh, and so it's a very uh, important technique that complements looking for J-couplings. Oh, so we'll actually spend some time in the second section talking about the origin of the nuclear overhauser effect uh, and uh, how you can measure it. So let's begin with a description of relaxation. And to do this, we need to go right back to the beginning, really, when we were talking about the vector model. And you remember that in the vector model, we start out by saying each spin had a magnetic moment associated with it, a magnetic dipole. And to a very good approximation, this little magnetic dipole behaves uh, like a bar magnet. And then the vector model is all about uh, the behavior of the average of these molecular moments. So you take the average of this over the whole sample. That gives you what I call the bulk magnetization. Uh, and then we discussed the behavior of the bulk magnetization. But if you're thinking about the behavior of the individual magnetic moments, they behave in an exactly same way as does the bulk magnetization. So for example, if one of these little magnetic moments happens to be tilted away from the z-axis, it will process around the z-axis at the Larmor frequency. 
if one of these little magnetic moments experiences an oscillating transverse magnetic field at the Larmor frequency, this little magnetic moment will be rotated away from or towards uh, the, the z-axis. And the point is that when you apply a radio frequency pulse, you affect all of the spins, all of the individual spins in the same way. But relaxation is caused by uh, similar magnetic fields, but these magnetic fields don't arise from things that you apply, like the pulse. They arise locally within the sample. They're called local magnetic fields. And the crucial thing is that the local magnetic field that each spin experiences is in principle different. So just to recap on that, because it's a very important point here, each little individual magnetic moment is going to behave in the same way that we talked about for the bulk magnetization. It will process, it will be rotated by transverse fields. These, when you apply a pulse, all of the spins experience the same field. But relaxation is about what happens when each spin experiences a slightly different local field. Uh, and that local field uh, is generated from within the sample rather than being something that you apply to the sample. So where does this local field come from? So uh, the commonest example of this, particularly in spin half nuclei, uh, is this so-called dipolar interaction. So imagine your spin A here, and then nearby there's another spin. This spin has a magnetic moment on it, and that generates a very small magnetic field which can be experienced by the first spin A. And that would be an example of a local field at A which is generated by a nearby spin. And the direction of this local field uh, varies depending on the orientation of B uh, with respect to A, um, and also its amplitude varies. So at a spin A, if there are nearby spins, you see a local field due to this interaction. And relaxation is caused by these local fields. These are active only over very short distances, so perhaps only a few angstroms. So each spin in the sample experiences a local field that's generated by a few nearby spins, but if you move across the sample to somewhere else, they experience a different set of local fields. So these local fields are random and they're different for each spin in the sample. And again, at the expense of repeating myself, that's completely different to a pulse. When you do a pulse, you apply a field that's the same for all the spins in the sample. The local fields, although as far as the spin is concerned, they're similar, they're little magnetic fields, they vary in direction and intensity as you go from um, uh, spin to spin in the sample. And it's these local fields that I'm going to show you now are the things that drive relaxation. So one way of thinking about this is just a sort of a little thought experiment that's quite helpful. So imagine I have 20 spins, not much of a sample, but there we are. And I'm going to imagine that by some miracle I've got all of these spins uh, so that they are in the low energy state, um, uh, the ones, well, the alpha state. So that means that they're all aligned with the magnetic field. And so if you add up the total Z component, I'm going to show it there as minus 20, because they're in the lower energy state. And now I did a simulation where I said, well, I imagine that I've got these local fields, and these local fields may be oscillating all sorts of frequencies, but sometimes they might be oscillating at the Larmor frequency. And in which case, they can cause the spin to change orientation. Remember that if you have a transverse field, the spin can change orientation. So instead of being down here, uh, so instead of being here uh, in the low energy orientation, it may get twisted away. And if you just allow that to happen at random, uh, after a little while, a few of the spins uh, get shifted from one 
uh, position to another. You'll see one has got shifted right up to the high energy state and another one uh, have got shifted a smaller distance. And if you add up the total magnetization now, it's minus 16 because of those positive ones. And if you let the simulation run for a bit longer, all these random fields, a few more of them get flipped backwards and forwards, and the total magnetization is now minus 12. And then if you leave this simulation to run for a long time, what do you get? Well, what you get is zero. Right? And that's what you'd expect, because if you're applying random fields which may flip the spin up or down through any random angles, if you let that run for long enough, they'll just end up being randomly distributed. And then at that point, nothing changes. So this is an example of how random fields will drive the spins from A, which is definitely not at equilibrium, to a situation D, which is at equilibrium because nothing is changing. But you'll have spotted, I hope, there's something wrong with D because it predicts that at equilibrium there is no Z magnetization. MZ is zero. That's not right. We know that at equilibrium there's a finite Z magnetization. And so this immediately uh, causes us to pause and we have to worry a bit about this. This simple model of random field seems to drive the Z magnetization to zero. And that's not correct. We know that the Z magnetization is finite uh, at equilibrium, not zero. And the reason for this is fairly subtle. It's to do with what happens when uh, the spins come to equilibrium. So you have to follow the argument closely. So imagine we've got a situation with my spins here, and let's imagine that we're going to increase the energy of one of the spins. It's going to be rotated away from the magnetic field. Now, where does that energy come from? Well, that energy comes from what we'll loosely call the surroundings. That's just basically everything else, the thermal motion in the sample. And so if the spin is going to go up in energy, it must acquire some energy from the surroundings. So that means that in the surroundings, something must have gone down in energy. Now think of it the other way around. Suppose these spins are going to go down in energy. Where does that energy go? That must end up in the surroundings. And therefore, the surroundings must, something must go up in energy. And the question is, are those two processes of the spins going up in energy and down in energy equally likely? And the answer is that they're not because of what happens in the surroundings. If the spins go down in energy, then the, uh, the, some energy needs to be absorbed by the surroundings. So the surroundings goes up. And if you think about the surroundings, you've got all these energy levels, and the lower energy levels are more highly populated, because that's what the Boltzmann distribution tells you. On the other hand, if the energy level, if the spins are going up in energy, they've got to get some energy from the lattice, from the surroundings, sorry, and the surroundings have to go down in energy, and that would have to go from a less highly populated level. So what this means is that the surroundings are, if you want to put it in uh, anthropomorphic terms, they are happier to take in energy than they are to give out energy. And so this probability of the spins going one way or going the other way are not equal. So the result of that is that when you come to equilibrium, you have a finite Z magnetization, not no Z magnetization. Now, physicists would describe this in terms of the uh, spins coming to equilibrium with what they call the lattice, that means the surroundings. And because the surroundings are at Boltzmann equilibrium, that drives the spins to a Boltzmann equilibrium. And a Boltzmann equilibrium is not where the equal populations, but where the lower energy state is more highly populated than the higher energy state. 
The reason I'm emphasizing this is that if you think about random fields, it's very hard to see why they just don't drive all of the magnetization to zero. Why do they create a finite magnetization? And the reason is because there's this imbalance between the spins going up in energy and going down in energy. So the net result is that low, we, low this process is driven by random fields. It does give rise to a finite Z magnetization at equilibrium. And this process by which the Z magnetization goes towards equilibrium is called longitudinal relaxation. Longitudinal in the sense it's parallel to the Z axis. Some people call it spin lattice relaxation, and I won't use that term because I don't find it very helpful. So the next thing we need to worry about is where do these random fields come from? And I've already mentioned one of them. It's the dipolar field, which is where the spin generate the field generated by one spin uh, is experienced by the nucleus we're interested in. And this is usually called the dipolar interaction. It varies as 1 over r cubed, the distance between the two nuclei. And it also varies as the product of the gammas of the two nuclei involved. So what this means is that this is strong for proton and much weaker for nitrogen-15 because of the gammas. And it also drops off very quickly with distance because of this r cubed. But it's the dominant source of relaxation for protons uh, uh, in, in, a, in a sample. The other source of local field that you'll commonly come across is the chemical shift anisotropy. So you remember that when you put a, a, a molecule in the magnetic field, the magnetic field experienced by the nucleus is modified by the electronic environment of the molecule. And that gives rise to the chemical shift. The same interaction actually modifies the, the magnetic field in both amplitude and direction. So as a molecule tumbles, uh, you generally find that there's a local magnetic field generated as a result of the chemical shift anisotropy. The only case where you don't get this is with very highly symmetric molecules where the chemical shift doesn't change with orientation. And the final source of local fields, which is quite common, is paramagnetic species. So it may be that if you have oxygen, O2, dissolved in your sample, there's a very large magnetic moment associated with the electrons in the oxygen. Or if, say, if you're dealing with a paramagnetic protein, uh, that can have a very dramatic effect on the relaxation because of the, electron, because of the large magnetic field generated by the electron. So we've got some random fields in the molecule and they are going to drive our system back to equilibrium. And these random fields are varying with time uh, and, and it's in a very complicated way because of course we're dealing with a very large number of molecules here undergoing thermal motion. So our next thing we need to engage with is how are we going to describe this random motion which drives uh, the relaxation? And this is where this uh, concept of this thing called the correlation time comes in. Now, in order to get relaxation, we've got to get transverse magnetic fields, that's local fields, and they've got to be changing at somewhere near the Larmor frequency in the same way that we have to apply a pulse at the Larmor frequency. So, for example, small molecules vibrate a lot, and that means that the dipolar field from one spin to another will keep changing. But those vibrations are at far too high a frequency to cause relaxation in NMR. The oscillations will give rise to varying fields, but they'll be at too high a frequency, way above the Larmor frequency. And in fact, it turns out that, particularly if you look in solution, the kinds of motions which give uh, changes in the local field on the right time scale are molecular collisions. So in a solution, you've got your molecule there, it's surrounded by the solvent, and it's all very kind of sticky and gooey. 
And although there are lots and lots of collisions between the molecules, uh, during any one collision, the molecule only tends to move by a very small amount. Um, and this process is therefore usually characterized uh, as a diffusive process. It's called rotational diffusion. I was trying to think up a good analogy for this, a bit difficult, but I mean, if you, for example, uh, had a football floating in the swimming pool and you were throwing ping pong balls at it, that would be a good example of rotational diffusion. Right? Each collision, if you were lucky, it might move the football a little bit, but only a little bit, and you'd take an awful lot of hits to actually get the thing to move a significant, uh, to move through a significant angle. So the picture you've got to have is the molecule here undergoing lots and lots of vibrations and it just keeps changing orientation a little bit in some random way. And this changes in orientation for typical solutions is on about the right time scale to cause relaxation. So this process is called rotational diffusion. Now it's characterized by the thing called the correlation time. And the correlation time is the average time that it takes a molecule to move through one radian. So you imagine your molecule here and it's going wobble, 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 and you wait and you wait and you wait and eventually it might have moved through one radian. And then you look at the next molecule in the sample and the next molecule and you work out the average for all the molecules, how long it took them on average to go through one radian. So that's what the correlation time is. And it's a single parameter that characterizes this random diffusive motion. So the correlation time describes the time scale for the motion. So if the, time, if the correlation time is short, that means the molecules are moving quite quickly because it doesn't take them long to move through one radian. If the correlation time is long, that means that the molecules are moving uh, slowly because it takes a long time for them to move through one radian. So again, it might be helpful to have a little simulation here to, uh, to show what this means. So what I did was I, I took three molecules in the computer and I set them all off with a particular orientation at an angle of zero and then I allowed them to experience this kind of random diffusive motions and allowed them to move through a small angle uh, when there was a hit. And if you look at molecule one, you can see it's kind of going wander, 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 wander and it goes on and on, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. But by the time I gave up on the simulation, it still hadn't made it to one radian. Molecule 2, that didn't get anywhere at all. It would have wandered around a bit and ended up where it started. Molecule 3 headed off in the other direction but still didn't make it. And Molecule 4 didn't make it either. So what you can see is that over the time scale I did here, none of these molecules made it to one radian. Uh, so my simulation was running for a time that was definitely shorter than the correlation time. So now I redid it again, and this time I allowed the molecules to move uh, a slightly larger distance on each collision. That would be, for example, like saying that the solvent viscosity was lower. And now you'll see molecule one uh, is ripping along and it got beyond one radian. Molecule two almost made it to a radian. Molecule three did, and the fourth one still didn't get anywhere. So you can see that probably uh, the time scale of my simulation is of the order of the correlation time in this case. So the correlation time is about how on average, how long on average, it takes the molecules to get a radian from their starting position. So you wouldn't have to do it for four molecules, you'd have to do it for 10 to the 14 molecules. Now, fortunately, because it's random processes, you don't actually need to um, do the calculation. So this is how you would formally define the correlation function. Looks a bit horrendous, but it's actually fairly straightforward. You would take the local field at time t, and you would multiply it by the local field a time tau later. So it's B1 at time t, and then the local field at time t plus tau. Uh, 
and that's for the first spin and then you do the same thing for the second spin B lock 2, B lock 2 and you do it for all of the spins in the sample so you calculate all those products and you divide it by the total number of molecules in the sample and that's a definition of the correlation function if you express it in a summation notation it looks like that and that's normally done in a shorthand by putting a bar over it and the bar means the average over the sample so it's the average of the local field at time t product with the local field at time tau later and for the sorts of processes that we're interested in um, it turns out that this usually only depends on tau so if you calculate the correlation function now and you do it now and then you do it now you get the same answer it doesn't matter what t is it only matters what this interval tau is so we'll write the correlation function as only depending on tau now again it's difficult to grasp what this means it just looks like some mathematical formula so again here's a picture trying to give you a sense of what does the correlation function mean and how might it change so look at the top I've got some several different spins here each one indicated by a blue dot and I've allowed them to have a local field uh, which is just randomly distributed between minus one and plus one and if I'm going to calculate the correlation time I have to take the local field at time zero and multiply it by the local field at time tau and then sum it over the whole sample that's the definition of the correlation time the correlation function so the first diagram here is the correlation function for time tau equals zero so the local fields are the same at time zero and at time tau because I'm artificially setting tau to zero so of course when you multiply them together you will always get a positive quantity and that's what's shown in the bottom there and then when you sum all of those you'll get a positive quantity as well so this tells you that at time tau equals zero the correlation function is a positive and it's actually the maximum value it could possibly be so that's one point we understand now I imagine a time later and I'm going to make this a short time later much shorter than the correlation time so there are the local fields at time zero at the top they're exactly the same as they were before and now here are the local fields a time tau later which is only a short time and if you run your eye over the comparison between those you'll see that most of them haven't really changed a few of them have changed a little bit so when you make the product of the top one with the bottom one almost all of them are positive still a few of them have come negative because they've changed quite a bit so that tells us when we sum all those black points G will still be positive but it will be less than it was at time zero so this correlation function starts at a maximum and then starts to decrease as the local fields start to change now if I do it for a time much longer than the correlation function now if you look at the local fields in the middle they've all changed because there's been a lot of motion so when you calculate the product of these two there's some are positive and some are negative and when you sum up all the black points you get almost zero so what we expect the correlation function to do is this we expect it to start at the large value and we expect it to decrease to zero and how quickly does it decrease to zero if we wait for a short time compared to the correlation time it's not changed much at all if we wait for a time compared to the correlation time it will be changed quite a bit and if we wait for a time long compared to the correlation time it won't have changed it will really have 
all gone to zero. So that's kind of what we expect the correlation function to look like. So we expect it to be a maximum at time zero and then decay thereafter. Now the simplest function that does this is an exponential. So this e to the minus tau over tau c. That's exactly what that does. It just decays from a maximum to zero and the rate at which it decays depend on this, depends on the correlation time. Now, this form of the correlation function is the pro appropriate for rotational diffusion of a sphere in a viscous liquid. And as you all know, all of your samples consist of spheres in viscous liquids. It's just the simplest assumption you could make. You can make much more complex assumptions about the form of the correlation function. Uh, and indeed, that's what people do that are interested in molecular motion. But we will just make the simplest possible assumption, which is that the correlation function is an exponential. Look at the three graphs at the bottom. Uh, as you increase the correlation time, as you go from the blue, from the gray to the blue to the black, um, the decay is slower. So a longer correlation time the correlation function falls off more slowly. Now what we usually do is take away this uh, amplitude factor and you have a what's usually called a reduced correlation function which is just the time dependent part and then you just pop in the amplitude which is the mean square local field at the front. Uh, that's just a different way of writing it and that's a normal thing. Now we need to try and remember what on earth we're trying to do. All right? What we're trying to do is we're trying to describe the origin of the motion which gives rise to relaxation. Remember that to get relaxation you need motion at the Larmor frequency. And all I've done so far is introduce this thing which is called the correlation function. How does this help us to understand how much motion there is at the Larmor frequency. And this is where the Fourier transform comes in again because g of tau is a function of frequency just like the free induction decay. If we Fourier transform it we will get a function sorry, g of tau is a function of time just like the free induction decay. If we Fourier transform it that will give us a function of frequency in other words just like the spectrum. And the quantity that we get, J of omega, it's called the spectral density, and it actually gives you the amount of motion at that particular frequency. Just in the same way that you look at the spectrum, you see the amount of intensity at that particular frequency. So by taking the Fourier transform of the correlation function, we get this thing called the spectral density function and then we can look at that and that will tell us how much motion there is at the Larmor frequency and that's the thing which will give rise to relaxation. So in fact if you Fourier transform this simple decaying exponential the form of the spectral density you get um, is actually the same thing as the absorption mode line shape. So it's there at the bottom, it's 2 tor c over 1 plus omega squared tor c squared. And if you plot that, which is what's shown here, you get something like this. So j of omega is the spectral density and the horizontal axis is omega. So what this tells you is first of all you always get the maximum amount of motion at zero frequency, which is not very helpful. And then the amount of motion decreases as the frequency increases. And that happens each time. And the shorter the correlation time becomes, as you go from the black to the blue to the grey, you find that the the correlation, the, this um, spectral density spreads out to higher frequencies. So if you look at somewhere about halfway along the axis, the grey curve 
is bigger than the blue curve is bigger than the black curve. So the shorter the correlation time, in other words, the faster the molecules are moving, the more spectral density you get at a higher frequency. In fact, this uh, curve has the property that its area is independent of tau c, and that's why the maximum at zero drops uh, as the correlation time drops. So the shorter tau c, uh, the more motion you have at higher frequency, and always the maximum is at zero frequency. Now, remember that in order to get relaxation, you've got to have local fields oscillating at the Larmor frequency, and that means the bit of this spectral density we're interested in is not the whole curve, but the bit at the Larmor frequency. So I can plot the spectral density in a different way. It's the same function, but this time I plot the spectral density at a particular frequency, the Larmor frequency, as a function of the correlation time. And if you plot that function, you'll find it increases and then decreases. And so that there is a particular correlation time which gives you the maximum spectral density at a particular frequency. And lo and behold, the correlation time of 1 over the Larmor frequency gives you the maximum spectral density at the Larmor frequency. So that's not really a surprise. So you've got these fluctuating things. They're fluctuating on a time scale that's indicated by the correlation function. And that's characterized by the correlation time. And if the correlation time is 1 over the Larmor frequency, you get the maximum amount of relaxation. It's a bit like Goldilocks and the porridge. Right? You know about Goldilocks and the porridge? Goldilocks goes into the bear's cabin, all right, and there's three bowls of porridge. And she tries the first bowl of porridge, and he says, yuck, it's too cold. Right? That corresponds to too short a correlation time. Then she tries the second bowl of porridge, that's too hot. And he says, oh, can't eat that. That corresponds to the correlation time being too long. And then she tries the third bowl of porridge, and the temperature is just right, and she eats it all up. And that corresponds to the correlation time being 1 over the Larmor frequency. So to get good, fast relaxation, the correlation time has to be just right. And what just right means is 1 over the Larmor frequency. All right. Now, one thing that we can look at here um, is what are called motional regimes. So uh, you can characterize this by thinking about the relationship between the correlation time and the Larmor frequency. So what I've got here is the spectral density at the Larmor frequency j omega naught, uh, j at omega naught. And you have this thing which is called fast motion, and this is where the correlation time is very short. And this would be typical of very non-viscous solutions. And in that limit, omega naught tau c is much less than 1. And you can therefore lose the term on the bottom to a good approximation. And the spectral density is then 2 tau c. And that means that the uh, spectral density is independent of frequency. And that's the characteristic of the fast motion limit. The other limit is the slow motion limit, where omega naught tau c is much greater than 1. This would be characterized by very large molecules in viscous solvents. And under that term, and that limit, you lose the 1 on the bottom, and j of omega naught becomes 2 over omega naught squared tau c, or you can write it in that other form there. And uh, typically, uh, J of omega naught in this slow motion limit is much, much less uh, than it is in the fast motion limit. And small molecules typically have correlation times in tens of picoseconds, and they would definitely be in the fast motion limit. And large molecules, they would have correlation times of the order perhaps of nanoseconds, and they would be in the slow motion limit. 
to summarize what we've got so far then. So this process of rotational diffusion, which is this random reorientational motion that you get in, uh, in liquids, that gives motion on a suitable time scale for relaxation in NMR. You can characterize rotational diffusion by a correlation time, tor c, and if you do that, you can write the spectral density, and that gives you the amount of motion present at a particular frequency, omega, in terms of this correlation function. And you'll see that the spectral density depends on the correlation function and, of course, the frequency. And in order to get longitudinal relaxation, you need to have spectral density at the Larmor frequency. So in other words, J at omega naught needs to be significant. And that turns out to be a maximum when uh, omega naught tor C is 1. So there's an optimum correlation time for longitudinal relaxation. OK, so we've got some idea about where relaxation comes from. And I think the next step is to sort of turn this into something which is more useful in the sense that you can describe uh, what is happening and understand relaxation rates and so on. And because we're going to be, first of all, con concerned with uh, the longitudinal relaxation, that's relaxation involving Z magnetization, it's actually quite useful to think of this in terms of populations. So you can think of your sample as either having the spins either up or down, either in the alpha or the beta state. Now, I know I said that that's completely wrong a few lectures ago, um, and it is indeed completely wrong, um, but for various reasons, it does actually work out perfectly okay within the context of this theory to make that assumption. So notwithstanding the fact I said it was wrong, today it's right. Okay. So if the spins are either up or down, remember they, that means their magnetic moments are either with or against the magnetic field, uh, you can see that the Z magnetization uh, will clearly depend on the population difference between the two states. So if you had an equal number up and down, the net Z magnetization would be zero. If you had an excess in one of the states, you would have a finite mag Z magnetization. So we can write the Z magnetization in terms of uh, the populations of the two states, alpha and beta. And actually from that, if you invoke the Boltzmann distribution to work out what n alpha and n beta are, you can work out what the equilibrium magnetization is. And you'll see there it depends on the magnetic field, not surprisingly. The stronger you make the magnetic field, the higher the equilibrium population. And it also inversely with the temperature, because of course increasing the temperature forces the two populations closer together. Now, this const, all these constants are neither here nor there because we can't really measure the absolute size of an NMR signal. So what I'm going to do is just write that the Z magnetization is just the difference of the populations and ignore all the constants. So MZ I'm going to write as N alpha minus N beta. And the equilibrium Z magnetization I'm going to write as N alpha zero minus n beta zero. So the superscript zero uh, will always indicate the equilibrium values. So if we think about our two energy levels, alpha and beta, uh, and about the relaxation process, we can actually start to write down what effect uh, the relaxation would have uh, on these populations of these two energy levels. In fact, this is just like doing uh, a, an analysis of an elementary chemical kinetics problem because I've got a process W alpha beta which takes me from the alpha to the beta state uh, and is caused by relaxation, and that's like a rate constant. And I've got a process W beta alpha which takes me from the beta to the alpha state and that's another rate constant. And this would be just like analyzing A goes to B uh, with a forward and reverse reaction. So if we think about the rate from alpha to beta, 
it would be equal to the rate constant, W alpha beta, times the population of the place we're coming from, which is alpha. So it's times N alpha. And if you think about the rate going from beta to alpha, that's W beta alpha times the population of the place we're coming from, which is N beta. Right now, it is important you spot that the rate in going from alpha to beta is proportional to N alpha, and the rate of going from beta to alpha is proportional to N beta. So if we want the overall rate of change of state alpha, it will have two terms. The first term will be a positive term, and that is from uh, the transitions coming down from beta to alpha. So that's the W beta alpha N beta term. So that's a gain term. And then there's a negative term. That's the term uh, which, which involves alpha going to beta. And that's W alpha beta times N alpha. And that's negative because that's a loss term. Right? So we've got a gain term and a loss term. And if you wanted to write the rate of change of N beta, there would be a gain term, but this time it's the W alpha beta N alpha, because that's the gain process going up, and likewise a loss term. And I emphasize again that this is exactly the same thing as you would use for analyzing chemical kinetics. So what we could say is, what would happen at equilibrium? Well, I know that when I get to equilibrium, the populations will no longer be changing, because right? that's essentially the definition of equilibrium. So I've written on the left there, the rate of change of populations is zero. And I also know that at equilibrium, the populations will be at their equilibrium values. So I've written n beta zero and al n alpha zero as the populations at equilibrium. So if I just rearrange, in fact, either of those two equations, you get the same thing, which is n alpha zero over n beta zero, in other words, the ratio of the equilibrium populations, is equal to the ratio of these two rate constants. And again, if you think about chemical kinetics, that's just like saying the equilibrium constant is equal to the ratio of the forward to back rate constants. Unfortunately, there's a problem with this, uh, and that is that if you do any elementary theory of relaxation, you come up with the conclusion that W beta alpha and W alpha beta are equal. And of course, that therefore predicts that N alpha zero is equal to N beta zero, which is plainly wrong, right? Because you know that at equilibrium, the lower state must have a higher population than the upper state. And in fact, this is exactly the same problem that we had right at the beginning of the talk when I was describing how the Z-magnetization doesn't actually go to zero equilibrium, it goes to a finite value. So to get around this, you either need to use a really rather more complicated theory, and most people don't tend to do that, they tend to rewrite these equations to produce the right answer, which is a well-known process in science. All right. So instead of writing the rate of change like that, which is what we thought it would be, what we do is we write everything in terms of the deviation from equilibrium. So if you look at that first equation, I had the population n beta. In the new equations, it's n beta minus n beta zero. In the first equation, it was n alpha. In the new equations, it's n alpha minus n alpha zero. So I'm rewriting everything, not in terms of the populations, but in terms of the deviations of the populations from the equilibrium value. Uh, from the equilibrium value. And if you do that, uh, everything will come out OK. And the, uh, at equilibrium, you'll find you get the equilibrium populations rather than equal populations. So from now on, we're going to do this. Uh, using a single rate constant there. So now we can put all this together and come up with an equation that describes how the Z-magnetization is going to change. 
So remember I said that the Z magnetization we were going to write as N alpha minus N beta. And therefore it follows that the rate of change of the Z magnetization will be equal to the rate of change of N alpha minus the rate of change of N beta. And we've already written those down, the rate of change of N alpha with those equations I just had on the previous slide as for the rate of change of n beta. And I'm using them for the form n beta minus n beta zero. So spot that they are these difference terms. So all I do is plug those into that first expression. And after you do a bit of rearranging, you actually end up with something that's relatively straightforward. This equation at the bottom here that says the rate of change of mz is equal to minus 2w, which is this rate constant, times mz minus mz0. And to get that, I've just used the fact that mz is n alpha minus n beta, and mz0 is n alpha 0 minus n beta 0. And how you would normally write this would be in the language of calculus, so instead of writing it in words, the rate of change of mz, you would write dmz by dt. And I'm going to define 2w alpha beta as rz, the longitudinal relaxation rate constant. So what this has done is produced for me what's actually a differential equation which describes how the z magnetization will behave as a function of time. And in fact, what this differential equation says is the rate of change of the Z magnetization, which is the term on the left, is proportional to the deviation of the Z magnetization from equilibrium. It's also sometimes written, instead of writing RZ, some t people write 1 over T1, and then T1 is then becomes a time constant for longitudinal relaxation. Now again, going back to this, um, you can see that this is what it means in words, that the rate of change of mz is proportional to the deviation from equilibrium. And what that means is if you leave the system alone, eventually mz will go to the equilibrium value. And that's of course exactly what we want, because that's what we know uh, happens. And if you're a dab hand with differential equations, you can integrate this equation. It's not a difficult one to do. It's a first order differential equation. And if you do that, the result you get is this. And you, of course, need to introduce a boundary condition in order to integrate this differential equation. And the one I've chosen is that at time zero, I've written the magnetization as mz bracket zero. So this equation is now an explicit equation for how the Z magnetization varies starting from some arbitrary initial position. And the graphs here just show some typical behavior. Uh, on the left hand side you see the Z magnetization starting at some arbitrary position and over time it always goes back to MZ0. And the three different lines correspond to three different starting positions. And on the, the right-hand side, I've kept the starting condition the same, but I've used different rate constants, different RZ values. And all that means is that the larger RZ is, the faster the magnetization goes back towards the equilibrium value. But note that it always goes back to the equilibrium value. So this equation can actually be used to analyze this very simple experiment that you can use to measure the uh, relaxation rate constant. This is called the inversion recovery experiment. So what you do is you start with a 180 degree pulse, which inverts the magnetization, so that drives it away from equilibrium. And then you allow a time tau in which the system recovers towards equilibrium. And then you do a 90 degree pulse to see how big the Z magnetization is uh, and measure the signal. Now, if I use the initial condition that the Z magnetization is inverted at time zero, then my differential equation integrates to that. It gives me an expression for MZ at time tau uh, as of that form. <coughs> 
and the 90 degree pulse just generates a signal that's proportional to the Z magnetization. So I can rewrite that equation and just say that the signal at time tau will follow exactly the same form with some arbitrary constant C in there. And you can uh, get some typical data you get from this kind of thing is to start with at time zero the magnetization is inverted and then the longer time is the magnetization recovers through zero towards the equilibrium value. And you can rearrange this equation into a straight line plot uh, and that tells you if you plot the log of that quantity against time the slope would be RZ. <coughs> And so that would give you a way of estimating the rate constant Rz. And that brings us to the end of the first section. Uh, we'll stop there.